politics, international affairs, religion. Name any component of the society, and it seems to have gone out of order. Wasn't all of this supposed to strengthen the society? Wasn't all of this meant to bring about peace? Then where did things go wrong? One may not find a single point in time where this chaos began to brew, but reasons, yes, we can always determine. So what is it that led the global society to this point where we find anything and everything but peace? From an individual to a family, from families to communities, and from nations to the international community, the one thing that seems to have gone missing is peace. The world's economic crisis has contributed hugely to global unrest and increased frustrations amongst the masses. Another major cause of division is internal power struggles within countries. And then, in many nations, the rights due to members of the public are being unjustly usurped. Another factor is that some parties seek to demonstrate their power and might by treating others extremely cruelly. Further, a root cause of division is a lack of justice in the world. This is leading directly to a complete lack of mutual confidence and trust. Another cause of unrest is the fact that people or governments look at the wealth and resources of others with a sense of, sense of envy and greed. In fact, they do not limit themselves to the envious classes, but actually seek to seize what is not rightly, uh, rightfully theirs. Watching news channels, the headlines that dominate the screens are all about conflict. US bombing Syria. Russia ready to retaliate. UK and France joining hands to go ahead with bombings in the Middle East. What is it that they are after? One superpower and the government and the opposition backed by another superpower directly or indirectly, at least that's what it comes up to on, 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 on the news channels when you watch them, that's what you see. And, and, and the fear factor is, is, is quite strong there. The answer is quite simple and straightforward. Wealth. It is but we never seem to have enough of. The Holy Quran states that people will be tested through their wealth. The modern society is clearly manifesting how nations are tested through their unfathomable desire and greed of acquiring wealth. The problem with the world today is not only um, an efficient financial system, but also a moral decline. Communism, socialism, Islamic socialism, all have been put to the test in attempts to solve the problem of wealth. Unfortunately, Nothing seems to have worked. So, one can say that this was destined to happen. Only then would the world pay heed to the word of God. I mentioned earlier how the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, migrated to Medina along with his followers and the manner in which the Muslims absorbed themselves into the local society was a perfect model of how to immigrate and integrate into a new society. Before the Muslims arrived, there were two main groups who lived in the city of Medina, the Jews and the Arabs. Upon the arrival of the Muslims, there became three groups, the Muslims, the Jews, and the non-Muslim Arabs. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, immediately stated that it was essential that they all live together in peace and harmony. And so he proposed a covenant of peace between them. According to the terms of this treaty, each group and each tribe was given their due rights. The lives and wealth of all parties was guaranteed and any pre-existing inter-tribal customs were also respected. 
that the state of Medina was established purely on Quranic principle. The economy was no exception. The basic principles were trading, profit and loss sharing, no interest involved in there, uh, trust, everything was based on trust. When people worked together, there was trust in it. Uh, there was no hidden elements in there. All information was available to, to, to the participants at that time. Uh, and obviously, then at the same time, the acquisition of wealth in a lawful manner, zakah, sadqa, all these basic pillars of Islamic economics basically were seen in Medina at that time. Of all religions, Islam places a greatest emphasis uh, in the life after death. So as such, Islam insists that the economic order should allow the greatest scope uh, for individual enterprise. A lot of his followers and companions followed him to Medina. They were then there in Medina asked to get involved in trade. A lot of them got involved in trade at that time. And one of the Sahaba, Abdul Rahman al Auf, became one of the richest traders after migrating from Mecca to Medina in Medina. Then, as the prophecy of the Holy Prophet wasallam, had it, Islam was to undergo a time where only its name was to survive and its true teachings were to vanish for more than a thousand years. The Muslim leaders are not fulfilling the rights of the poor and the overall Islamic economic principles uh, have been lost. It was only with the advent of the promised Messiah and the Mahdi that the true teachings of Islam were to be reinstated. The word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came through the revelations of the Holy Prophet and then the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet reinforced those and the promised Messiah reiterated the same principles going forward. Islam always treats economic matters as a part of its moral philosophy. Justice, legal justice, economic justice, social justice. If you look at the sermons of the Khulafa, every sermon has somehow emphasized on that. His successors have untiringly and relentlessly called the world to the teachings of Islam. So if the Islamic economic system has to provide food, shelter or means of education to everybody, it must have at its disposal very much larger resources than would have sufficed in the early days of Islam. Hazrat Muslim anhu lectured extensively and at length about the economic system of Islam. The acquisition of wealth in a lawful manner, zakah, sadqa, all these basic pillars of Islamic economics. But the most important is probably the institution of zakat, as it is in addition of being a pillar of the Islamic faith, a powerful instrument that aims essentially to enhance and raise the status of the weakest members of the population. He can, justifiably, be called the father of modern-day Islamic economics. Jamaat Amni has adopted many of the elements of Islamic economics. And actually, it's not only now, but has been for a long time. So the system of al wasiyat and of Tahrik al-Jadid comprise within themselves the whole economic and social system of Islam. We seek the immediate, unconditional, and complete withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Second, Kuwait's legitimate government must be restored to replace the puppet regime. I will ask oil producing nations to do what they can to increase production in order to minimize any impact that oil flow reductions will have on the world economy. And I will explore whether we and our allies should draw down our strategic petroleum reserves. جو بدقسمتی سے اس وقت دنیا کے اکثر سیاستدانوں کے دماغوں پر راج کر رہی ہیں سیاستدان کا مشرق کا ہو یا مغرب کا سہ فام ہو یا سفید فام بالعموم سیاست کے ساتھ شاطرانہ چالیں اس طرح وابستہ ہو جاتی ہیں کہ اخلاقی قدروں or siyasat ka ikattha chalne ka sawal nahi rehta. He had in his sermons very clearly stated 
that this greed is going to lead with the Western powers into the Gulf countries. When the Western powers clearly and shamelessly showed their unlimited lust for material wealth in the form of the Gulf War, Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad Sahib, may the mercy of Allah be upon him, the Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat at the time, clearly told how this lust of material and political growth had gripped the Western powers and where it could lead to. This dream is going to grow and how it will grow in the world to the world. These are very long things. I understand that this is the same thing about the Muslims. Until the Muslims are not able to do one after the other, until the time this is not possible for the Muslims. But who is the same thing? I can't say that it is the same thing or the same thing. Worldly powers have seldom paid heed to what religion says. Historically speaking, these powers have believed more in their own capabilities than believe in the all-knowing God. So their economic lust stayed on the rise and became their prime objective. Economic depressions kept threatening their economies, shaking the castles of the economic prosperity but their materialistic desires of geopolitical expansion remain undeterred. And this ideology is particularly dangerous because it can lead us to a third armed conflict on a planetary scale whose effect would be disastrous and from where no winner can emerge. The Middle East Being a region with bottomless reserves of oil remained the bone of contention between the Western superpowers. The Gulf countries, which supply, which hold actually 60% of global oil reserves, and that greed will take them there, and which is the case, which 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 finally ended up with war, uh, the 1990 Gulf War. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. War on terror destroyed the whole economic and social fabric by bombing roads, towns, airports, financial centers. So war on terror has led us to more disasters. What added fuel to the fire was the incompetence of the leadership of these nations. And on behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, United Kingdom, we welcome you to the 15th National Peace Symposium 2018, organized here at the Beit of Two Mosque Complex in London. It was in such circumstances that Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, emerged on the horizon of the global scene. There is a, a perilous situation of regional conflicts growing, spreading, and the threat, the very real threat of a third world war. So the Peace Symposium is a platform where Hazur uses that to promote the message of peace, to prevent conflicts in general, but to prevent a third world war. And the reason is that conflicts are, uh, destroy economies. They take millions of lives and then the cost of rebuilding countries and nations after war is devastating. It's at a huge scale. So it's the idea of the Peace Symposium economically is very important that for the prosperity of the world, you must work together to prevent conflict and war. Besides many other divinely assigned tasks, Hazur took the challenge of leaving no stone unturned to get the message of Islam to the world that was on the verge of a social, moral and economic breakdown. Injustice in international affairs, the distortion uh, of wealth between countries and nations is another way that the economies of countries are devastated. And Hazur in his speech talks about justice at every level and that the resources and wealth of nations, particularly the poor nations, must not be exploited because ultimately these come back and destroy the economy of those countries, the countries that seek to exploit and the wider world in general. Also, in a third way, is the issue of corruption and the need for um, a tackling the gap between the rich and poor. So Hazur has spoken repeatedly 
about the need for honesty so that when you have leadership in countries, they promote economies and promote policies that bring people to the same level uh, of, um, uh, give them the same opportunities and promote equal opportunity to give countries a better and a stronger economy. People living in the world's poorest nations do not concern themselves with the environment or the latest triggers on carbon emissions. Rather, they wake up each day wondering if they will be able to feed their children. Their economic plight is truly desperate and their poverty levels are far beyond our comprehension. For example, there are numerous countries where the majority of citizens do not have access to clean drinking water and are forced to survive by using dirty pond water to, full, uh, to fulfill their basic needs. Even that too is not easily available. Rather, women and children have to travel each day for miles on end to collect water for their families, which they carry home in big vessels balanced on their heads. We must not consider such hardship as other people's problems. Instead, we must realize that the result of such poverty has severe implications for the wider world and directly affect global peace and security. The impact of His Holiness's peace initiatives was widely felt. Addresses went live and were recorded on MTA. Their global circulation on social media and the coverage in print media did not go unnoticed. His Holiness was, and still is, invited by parliamentarians to address the congregations on the issue of global peace. At the last symposium, we had representatives from 31 countries. So the effect of the symposium is very significant. It is increasingly making an impact in the media. Um, uh, we have the symposium Hazur holds an international press conference. And the truth is that the, the symposium is held because it is our belief and our duty to promote peace. This, in an atmosphere where Islam is seen as a symbol of terror, is in itself faith-inspiring that a Muslim leader is invited and welcomed by the political machinery of Western states to address them on the topic of peace. What we find is when you talk to people who attend the event, whether they be secretaries of state, ambassadors, or just ordinary people, they are inspired by Hazur's words. They find in Hazur a fearless leader who is prepared and willing to speak truth to those in power because of his genuine concern of a need for change, a change for good, a change that promotes peace rather than war. Right from the very onset, His Holiness has always drawn the attention of the Western powers to the fact only Muslims and their acts of terrorism are not to be blamed. I do not agree with the, this point that uh, there is some link between radicalization and Islam. You can say that there is a link between radicalization and Muslims. But Islam is a teaching. And the teachings of Islam it categorically explains that there should not be any extremism. There should not be any thing which uh, helps you to serve the right of others. What needs to be seen more into is the role of Western nations in fueling these terroristic tendencies. You see, it was actually smoldering for some time. After uh, the Iraq war. And then, you see, there were so many things in the mind of the Muslims. And it was incited by the Muslim clerics that West is causing the trouble to, to finish Islam, to stop developing the Islamic countries. So, and the Iraq war flared up, flared it up. 
later on, it, the economic crisis of 2008 also, you know, played a role in it, where, where there was some uh, unemployment, economic crisis everywhere in the world, and uh, you cannot exclude uh, the Western countries, developed countries from this. Even they suffered, you know it very well. Where the rights of people are usurped by those that are stronger than them, then obviously it's not only ambivalence that develops, but a lot of hatred that develops. And when hatred develops, it leads to fear. And when it leads to fear, people are then willing to do whatever they can in order to, uh, to, to, to protect themselves. Now, when people protect themselves and pick up guns and arms, or, or even pick up sticks to go out, you know, the, the, the stronger one calls them, these guys are terrorists. His Holiness has always, but especially lately, been pointing towards the unjustified economic desires of Western nations as a major actor in the whole play. The play that the West itself chose to call the War on Terror. I have delivered the same message calling for peace and justice. On many occasions in different parts of the world, I do the same. I do not know how much impact my views have had on those who have listened to me. And I am not aware to what extent they are working towards developing peace within their own circles of influence. Nevertheless, I will, God willing, always continue to carry out my task and my responsibilities of promoting peace, tolerance, justice, and compassion to the corners of the world. I will continue to tell all people that in order to be relieved of the pain and suffering that we face today, we must adopt true justice and equality. And what they find in Hazu's speech is someone who is a leader, who is fearless, who is sincere, whose words of wisdom are profound, and who has a genuine desire to change the course of the world from conflict to peace. So the message of the current caliph is quite clear. It is a message based on the Islamic concept of absolute justice and on the Islamic philosophy of the golden mean, of the middle ground. I think the current caliph has played a, a, a very significant role, uh, both in terms of peace in the world and in terms of the economic uh, crisis, by sending letters two years ago to the world leaders um, telling them about, in very clear words, you know, what would be the implications if they do not, uh, if, if they do not exercise justice, if they do not exercise restraint. He says that whilst Islamic teachings command Muslims to fulfill the rights owed to God, they also instruct us to fulfill the rights of God's creation. So the Caliph's message can definitely lead to a state of economic peace with a very clear guideline from His Holiness. What is now left is for the world leaders to realize that the only way forward is to pay heed to the words of the divinely appointed Khalifa, a Khalifa appointed by the God who is the Almighty.